They come in there. They come in there. I'm going to give them a few seconds to get on the stage and get seated, and we will, uh, and we will start in a second. Doesn't this auditorium, if you, if, you, if you grew up and you went to public school in the city of Philadelphia, doesn't this auditorium take you back? Now wait a minute, and for those of you who are sitting in the real seats, do the seats still just stay up and then you have to pull them down when you sit? Okay, all right. This is the real deal. Y'all let us know when, uh, when we're ready. Okay, let us start by saying good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with each of you. I want to start by acknowledging the house that we are in right now. Um, Principal Erica Green, are you here? Where are you, Madam Principal? Can you come stand up here with me for a second? I heard it. I heard it. So I heard it. <laughs> Principal uh, Erica Green, we thank you so very much for allowing us um, to be here today to report on our first 100 days. Um, thank you for allowing us to be in your house. Um, first, we want to say a thank you to the students that are present on here today. All of the students who are present, wave your hands so we can see you. Now, I need the audience to know that these students are part of the World Affairs National Junior Honor Society. A sample of fifth, sixth, and seventh graders and students from the Cougar Media, uh, media Blog, um, Principal Erica Green, Assistant Principal Tasha Sanford, Climate Manager James Washington, Conwell School team of students, of teachers, um, the staff members, the parents and neighbors, um, the Learning Network, nine, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Edwards, Dr. Cooper, the CASA President, um, and Dr. Dr. Watlington, your team is trying to take care of you. They said, don't forget our Dr. Watlington. Where's Superintendent Watlington? Let me um, also today uh, publicly affirm all of our elected officials who are uh, present um, on today. I'm looking for a list of names that I should acknowledge. With that being said, I'm going to ask each and every one of you who are present to please stand. Now, don't, no, no, madam. Now, now, here's the leader of the Philadelphia delegation of the Pennsylvania House sitting down. I just said, please stand. Don't sit down yet. No. Intergovernmental cooperation and planning. All of us, we need each other. We can't get anything done if we don't all work together. Our uh, chair, Morgan Cephas, uh, Councilwoman, yes. Councilwoman Ketsy Lozada. Y'all heard that? So y'all know whose district we in today, don't y'all? State Representative Jose Giral. Jose. And listen, so Ketsy Lozada holds it down 
in the council, and Rep. Rao holds it down in the Pennsylvania House. We, this is your home base. <laughs> council member Mark Squilla. <laughs> City Commissioner Chairman Omar Sabir. State Representative and former Chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus and State Rep, I don't ever want to fight, Donna Bullock. Yeah. Our Sheriff, our Sheriff who no one expected us, working in partnership with the Council President, I think we're getting close to being able to make a super huge announcement. Was that diplomatic enough, Sheriff? We're on our way, right? Give it up for Sheriff Rochelle Bilal. The next council member is a resident, longtime resident of this community. He has been a courageous advocate and quite frankly was one of the teachers who made sure that I understood what was happening on the ground and met with residents and community-based leaders who were here before proffering any prospective solutions for what I thought would happen. Um, and, and that is council member Jim Harrity. Next, got a super huge election coming up and the chairman is here. And I'm also uh, happy that our uh, commissioner, Lisa Dealey, is president. She's got the right color on, one Philly. One Philly, I like it. <laughs> the next lady makes sure all of the finances are in order in the city of Philadelphia. If it's wrong and she expects that there is any malfeasance, she will audit you. And uh, that's our city controller, Christy Brady. This next gentleman, and I know being in this school is extremely important to him uh, because he's chair of city council's committee uh, on children and youth. Um, I also think that he happens, with all due respect, Council Member Lozada, he represents the greatest council district in the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> council Member Anthony Phillips, the ninth council manic district. <laughs> How you doing? Finally, is he here on stage with me? He should be. I, I want you all to know that, in, and I'm going to talk just a, a bit about this budget that we introduced um, here in the city of Philadelphia, my one Philly budget. But we introduced that budget to our legislative partners in the City Council of Philadelphia. And everything that you're going to hear me talk about on today, it doesn't get implemented. Um, and it won't be um, the, the kind of, of longevity that we need and consistency that we need without the partnership of the City Council of Philadelphia. I'm proud that it is led by a gentleman who has experience on the ground as a community organizer. You hate when I say it, but you were one of the early, you know, anti-violence advocates before it became a popular thing for people to do when you founded Peace Not Guns. He was a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, a member of council, and now he is the president of the City Council of Philadelphia. Give it up for Kenyatta Johnson. The team has, uh, has said that we need, to, we need to get started. I'm just going to say to the audience, and when y'all see me pick this up, don't you say a word. That means it's happening. Okay? Don't say a word. Listen, let me formally and officially say to you good afternoon. To my cabinet and the Parker administration assembled here behind me, to the members of the City Council of Philadelphia who joined with us, including my friend and colleague, Council President Johnson, the Pennsylvania General Assembly, members of Congress who are represented, um, and all city and state officials here with us, um, to the many 
And I saw some of you when we were walking in, the neighborhood organizational leaders who are here with us, the nonprofit leaders, the business community leaders, faith-based leaders, organized labor, and most importantly, every resident of the city of Philadelphia who is here with us or watching through some kind of streaming vehicle. Um, I welcome every single one of you, uh, and I thank you for being present. Um, on today, we're gathered here because the Parker administration has formally and officially reached its 100th day in office. <laughs> now, from me, that sound that you just heard from me and the team, it wasn't a collective exhale, but it was everyone on stage inhaling, right? preparing and literally getting what's ready for us to work on next. Because this is, this is not the end of anything on today. Uh, we are here today to announce the beginning, and that is the beginning of the Parker administration's plans to fulfill my promise to the people of Philadelphia that together we will create a safer, cleaner and greener Philadelphia with access to economic opportunity for all. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from a term that you've heard often uh, during uh, uh, my administration, and you're going to hear from what I call my subject matter experts. These are the incredibly hardworking members of the Parker administration cabinet, and these are the folks who are going to go in detail uh, to you and for you and with you with what we've accomplished for the people of Philadelphia in our first 100 days in office. Now, um, before I give you the highlights of what's coming, um, I want to speak to you all uh, as mayor about what these first 100 days have been like for me personally, because a whole lot of people are calling and they're asking, what has it been like? If I'm being very truthful and direct with you, the emotion that I have felt the most when I've been in that historic office, sitting in that chair, that people told me that I shouldn't say out loud because I was a woman, and if I said it out loud, people would think that I was weak. I don't mind sharing with you that I feel extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable because I don't care how clear I've communicated my vision for a safer, cleaner, and greener city with that access to economic opportunity for all, um, with a government that people can see, touch, and feel. The fact of the matter is that none of it becomes a reality just because the mayor says so. It's about assembling a talented group of men and women to lead the effort and then doing our best to mobilize and inspire the men and women who we saw on the way coming in who made us extremely proud, who are keeping our city moving on a daily basis. Um, that's why every day, no matter what you hear, my big three, Chief of Staff Tiffany Thurman, Chief Deputy Mayor Sincere A. Harris, and Aaron Platt. And it really should be the big four, because I don't walk or talk or do anything without Tanya Cook artists. <laughs> the, they are working to ensure that the goals of this administration are met. And I said to Director Teal, he and I were just having a sidebar when we were coming in, that change is difficult. And whenever you're trying to change culture, culture's difficult. Culture makes people uncomfortable when you're trying to change it, Mr. President. And we're trying to do a few things a little different. So I'm not trying to make anybody feel uncomfortable. We're just trying to deliver supports and services in a way that's reflective of how this uh, administration um, is, is trying to deliver services. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again, and I want to be forthright about this. We are not perfect. None of the people sitting on this stage are perfect. When you hear us 
talk about doing the best that we possibly can. We're saying that to you because we want you to know that we are 10 toes down, 10 fingers down, doing everything that we can with every tool that we have. But we know there is going to be something that is missing, something that could be criticized. To the people of our great city, I want to say this to you directly. I want you to pay close attention to the people who get or seem to get warm and fuzzy when something goes wrong. If they're not fully engaged in some way, shape, or form in trying to make our city better in their daily ongoings, none of us should be proud if something that we are proffering or a solution that we are putting on the table is not working as effectively or efficiently as we desire, our job is to control for it. Our job is to correct it. Our job is to do everything that we possibly can to ensure that we are maximizing the efficient use of scarce government resources and doing it to the best of our ability, and that includes our talent. Is everybody still with me? I will never allow naysayers, purveyors of negativity, to interfere with our ability to make good on the promise that I made to you, the people of the city of Philadelphia. As long as they see us doing the best that we possibly can to deliver a government that they can see, touch, and feel in the neighborhoods where they live, where they can see their tax dollars at work in their neighborhoods, I believe that they will support us the best way that they possibly can. 100 days, intergovernmental collaboration. Before I purview what's coming, I want to tell you about something. Biden-Harris, the President of the United States, Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, Forget politics. I've only been here for 100 days on today. Our President of the United States, Vice President Harris, and our congressional delegations, they have delivered the city of Philadelphia more than $536 million in federal aid, grants, and assistance. I don't know about you, but on the day, if he's listening, thank you, Mr. President, send more. Somebody wants some details, and they're saying, if you sent 536 million, tell us how. I'm glad you asked. 25 million for improving our water and sewer infrastructure. 20 million to upgrade systems at the Philadelphia International Airport. 1.5 million for workforce development for workers in the electric vehicle industry. 317 million for a whole new line of rail cars for SEPTA. Give that a huge round of applause, please. $159 million for the Chinatown Stitch Highway capping project that's reconnecting portions of Chinatown. That's $159 million. And just this week, because I, I said one number on Monday and it was that number, but right after we said that number, we got $14 million more and that was to rebuild two bridges in Fairmount Park in Northwest Philadelphia. That's $536 million. That's over half a billion dollars with a B. Thank you. <laughs> so when anybody asks you what the Biden-Harris administration has done for the city of Philadelphia, if you forget anything, just tell them, go see my mayor. She will let you know what they've delivered. On public safety on today, you're going to hear 
from our police commissioner, Kevin Bethel, on the highly anticipated comprehensive public safety plan for Philadelphia. I've said it out loud. I've said it in small rooms and big rooms. I've said it in this city when we've traveled to other events outside of the city. I believe the city of Philadelphia has the best police commissioner in the nation. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Y'all, and because I know how competitive it is out there to find talent, if there's anybody watching thinking you're coming, you're going to have to see all the people who just stood up if you think you're going to take them from us. Uh, he's ours, and, and I'm proud, though, that on today, he's going to tell you how that plan will get more police officers out from behind desks and on the streets of Philadelphia to make our city safer. He's going to explain to you how the Philadelphia Police Department is returning to a model of community policing and how that will help to create bonds of trust again between communities and our police. Council President, he's going to talk about PI. He's going to talk about prevention, intervention, and enforcement as a part of the plan because for all of us who are in this room, when we think about our big challenges, we know we just can't police our way out of them. We have to have a holistic approach. But I want to be clear about this. We are releasing the commissioner's comprehensive public safety plan for Philadelphia today. He's going to talk about it in much more detail. Before I turn to another critical challenge, I want to break some news here today. Mr. President, this is important to you, and if Council, uh, Council Member Jones were here, he would jump for joy. We cannot go into the details, because we have to get brief. So I couldn't give details even if I wanted to, because we got to be brief. But we're on our way, and she just shares this with me. Where is our city solicitor, Renee Garcia? Can you just, Pete, she's so, can you stand up so people can see you? <laughs> just come around here for a second, it's worth it. I want you to see who, who it is. When we told you that we would use every tool in the toolbox to ensure the public health and safety of the city of Philadelphia, we meant it. And an important step by our law department under solicitor Renee Garcia, um, I think we've got not just one step closer, we'll announce details soon, but we are one step closer to getting ghost guns off our streets and holding gun dealers accountable. <laughs> Under the, the, the legal leadership of Renee Garcia, don't listen to what we say, watch what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Quick story, the city, uh, they filed the lawsuit last year against two companies, Polymer 80 and JSD Supplies. These are the primary manufacturers and distributors of illegal ghost guns recovered in our city. And we needed to find a way to hold them accountable for their role in supplying the crime gun market and perpetuating gun violence. Listen, 90% of ghost guns recovered in Philadelphia are made or sold by those two companies. 90%. Renee has just informed us and she's going to work, walk through the details of what it is because she's going to brief the council president and me about it. But she just signed a settlement which is going to require those companies to halt all sales of ghost guns online and in stores for four years. and in person at gun shows for two years in Philadelphia. In addition to that, the city is going to receive some funds and we have to, we have to figure out how 
how we're going to get them. Is it going to be over 100 years, Ms. President? I'm hoping that it's not going to be that long. But I heard the number is about 1.3 million to fund efforts to address gun violence and efforts to get illegal guns off of our street. That's huge, City of Philadelphia. Adam Teal, our managing director, you're going to hear from him some details about our comprehensive strategy to provide long-term care, treatment, and housing to people in Kensington and other neighborhoods, not just Kensington. I want to be clear about that. This is a challenge that we're dealing with across the city. It's just silent in some other communities. Those who are suffering from addiction, facing mental health and behavioral health challenges, and or are unhoused or homeless. We want you to know on today that the status quo that's been able to prevail here in Kensington in particular, particular the open air drug markets, the widespread addiction, the deep despair, that it is unacceptable and change is on the way. Change is on the way. He is going to brief you on our progress and our plans to restore once proud community into a neighborhood of choice and a beacon of hope, again with the plan that comes from the ground up. No one coming from outside of the community thinking that it knows what's best for the community being impacted. The voices of the people who live here are the voices that we will hear most. Public safety coordination and outreach. Adam Gear, our chief public safety director, a brand new position in government that was created by our city council of Philadelphia. He's going to tell you about his work coordinating the administration's public safety response across government, as well as his work conducting outreach and engaging with residents and families who have experienced violence and trauma in their lives. He is a critical part. What he does is a critical part of our holistic strategy citywide to reduce violence and to make our community safer. One part here that's near and dear to me, Carlton Williams, our director of clean and green initiatives for the city of Philadelphia. He is who I describe as uh, the lead captain who is shepherding us all in creating the Office of Clean and Green Initiatives, which you know is one of the largest investments in my One Philly budget that I presented to the City Council last month. Carlton has gotten a lot done in 100 days, and he's going to give you a progress report. But there was one, and I don't know if anybody who was there is with me today, that I experienced, um, and this was just this last week. Do you all remember uh, last month when I pledged in my budget to city council that we would remove 10,000 abandoned cars from our neighborhood? You remember when you heard me say that out loud? Well, there's a location on Parkside Avenue at 49th Street that used to be a place where illegal dumping took place all of the time. It was the standard at 49th Street. But thanks to Yatina Dudley, a community member in Parkside, and a whole lot of other people pitching in, including the leadership of Councilmember Curtis Jones, a beautiful thing is blossoming right now at that same location, and it's called Container Village. Container Village. I need to tell you what it is if you haven't seen it. They're small business vendors. Um, majority minority. They're operating businesses out of converted and large shipping containers. I don't know about you, but that's innovative thinking because I never thought of opening up a store in a shipping uh, container. But we were there for the Philly Spring Cleanup Day um, when, by the way, Clean and Green and the people of Philadelphia sponsored over 1,000 community cleanups, a new record for our city and neighborhoods across our city, over 1,000 cleanups. The issue is, what do we need to do? 
We need to grow Container Village, but we also need the intergovernmental work that Director Williams put on display. He had Clean and Green, the Sanitation Division under Commissioner Crystal Jacobs Shipman, the Parking Authority under Rich Laser, and together they worked, and this is what they did. They pulled out nine abandoned cars, nine abandoned cars in one location at one lot. And for those of you who thought it was going to be hard to get to 10,000, we just got nine in one place. And not only did we get nine cars, we got a boat. A boat. That was extremely important. But when people saw that it was gone, it affirmed for them the action, the action that we have promised to the people of the city of Philadelphia and making our city safer, cleaner, and greening. In a nutshell, we're going to do that all over the city of Philadelphia. He's also going to tell you about our expansion of PHL taking care of business. For those of you who know me, you know it's my baby. It's a novel idea that we stole from the Center City District. How about we hire people who live in neighborhoods to clean those neighborhoods, give them access to soft skills uh, training, technical supports, resume writing, OSHA certification, safe serve certification, and then feed them into future track where they can become City of Philadelphia employees. It's economic opportunity. We're hiring 150 more cleaning ambassadors this year through a nonprofit neighborhood-based partnerships across the city, and we're super excited. You're also going to hear from Alba Martinez. She is our tremendous commerce director, and she has already started to yield results in paving the way for us to get to economic opportunity for all, especially for small business owners and more diversity of opportunity in our city. She's going to tell you what she's doing to promote workforce development and those economic opportunities. She's going to describe what PHL Open for Business means, and it's a new way of doing business uh, to interact with the city. She's going to give you details, and this is something that's extremely important to me, and I have to give credit because this wasn't a Parker idea. This was Harold Epps and Della Clark communicating with me for about a year and a half. She's going to talk to you about the exciting work of a new office called the Office of Minority Business Success, led by Rachel Branson, and it's an innovative way to engage and support and help to grow diverse businesses in the city of Philadelphia. Rachel, are you here? Where are you, Rachel? And Darnell Thomas. Rachel and Darnell, stand up, please. Okay. Education. I'm telling y'all, we hit the jackpot. You're going to hear from three very respected people within the education community that starts with our superintendent, Dr. Tony Watlington. He's our superintendent of schools. Dr. Deborah Carrera, the Parker Administration's chief education officer, and Vanessa Garrett Harley, our deputy chief managing director for the Office of Children and Families. Thank all three of you for being here. They're going to tell you about our progress so far in our agenda for education for every student in Philadelphia, whether they're in the traditional public or a charter school. They're going to talk to you about where and when we're going to provide full year out of school programs and job opportunities for students, listen, outside of regular school hours. Um, I'm also super proud, and I don't know if you all saw the list. We uh, have our nine nominees that we have submitted to the City Council of Philadelphia for consideration for the Board of Education. And we uh, shared those with Dr. Watlington, Labor, and all of our other stakeholders. And they had some strong things to say about that group of people. Uh, some of them are here with us today, and I want all of our nominees who are present to please stand up. Any nominees who are present? Thank you. Six out of nine. Thank you. We appreciate you all for being here. Housing. When I was walking down the street just now, someone yelled, don't forget that we need housing. 
we know and we hear you. You're going to hear from John Monlack, our interim director of planning and development, and he's going to talk about our progress towards addressing the city's needs for housing and how the administration is going to do it by treating everyone with dignity and by creating affordable luxury housing. Affordable luxury housing, a term I want you to get accustomed to. Why did we need to redefine what affordable means? Because sometimes when you say affordable, people think you mean low standards. That is not what we are talking about growing and building here in the city of Philadelphia. Our goal is high, is 30,000 units of housing. 30,000 units of housing in four years. New homes for homeowners, apartments for renters, and programs to help existing homeowners. Necessary repairs to their homes, training the workforce that will be responsible for making those repairs because we want them to stay in our home. Now you heard me mention, and I can't say it out loud now, but Sheriff, you know, I, I, was, I was prepared to announce today, but we're getting close. Would you say we're getting close? We get, give the sheriff a huge round of applause because we, Mr. President, we're getting close. We're closer than we were. Subject matter experts. I'm enormously proud of them. Everything that they and their departments have done for these first 100 days and for every challenge that lies ahead. I can't make, wait to meet those challenges with each of them. Uh, you're going to hear first from our police commissioner, and let's show him some love and appreciation, Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel. I think by now, usually I, I get to follow right after the mayor, and, and so I usually take the mic off and I just drop it like that. I said, I don't know why she doesn't drop the mic when she comes off. And you could have left that fan up here for me too. <laughs> I, I, I do, um, I don't know how, how people know how I feel about this work. Um, and people know my why and why I came back. I saw Principal Green, where'd she go? Here she is. I don't see, I see some of my other principals stand up for, in the area, my principals from the, from other principals around the community and. Uh, over a hundred days ago, I stood in this space and, and, and people, I told people, I came back because of the work and what I would see down in this area and, and across the city and, and, and I so much appreciate uh, Principal Green and the young people left, they, I guess they had to go back to class, uh, but they were so much important about my dream to be here. And so to come back 100 days later, the symbolism of that to me is so critical and so I want to I thank the mayor for her leadership, I want to thank her for uh, the vision to make the city a safer, cleaner and greener city. I always forget that economic tag. I'm going to get that one. Uh, I want to do actually I thank um, Managing Director Adam Teal, as well as um, Public Safety Director Adam Gear, And then I got to thank my budget guy, because I couldn't be up here doing this stuff without Rob DeBow, and he's back there somewhere. He probably said, yo, yeah, he must be coming for more money. Uh, but, but that's how we do it, Rob. That's how we do it, right? Um, today is a special moment for us, and, but I also have to recognize uh, the law enforcement men and women in this house, right? Uh, it's been a long time since we heard those claps and that, that level of support. And so I know when you, when you show that love and support to me, it is representative of the work that they do. You know, we are unveiling a plan today that is a co comprehensive work of my entire team. You know, and I know Blake Norton and, and, and Fran and others were helping lead that work. Kevin Thomas is not here. John Stanford and my entire executive team. I thank each and every one of you for your hard work and to be able to bring this vision that the mayor put forth to us into, into, into the, our present state. So thank you. Thank you. 
So, so as we, as we, I like that too. I see you over there. That's, that's what I'm talking about. I got a clapper here. Um, so part of our plan, is, our mission is clear, uh, to improve the safety and strengthen the trust between the police department and community we serve. Um, you will see a very robust plan. And part of people say, well, why do you do a plan with so much stuff in it? Because my mayor says it's about action, yes. right? It's about getting the work done. It's not about asking a lot of questions. She even made me change my, I was doing listening sessions around the city, she said, listening sessions, listening, you gotta get stuff done. And, and so I, I said, I'm gonna take that listening off my title and just have these meetings uh, because I wanna make sure I get it right. Part of when you open up our plan, we'll be talking about smart policing. You know, and it's a model that we, I endeared back in my time in 2013 as Deputy Commissioner running patrol operation and encompasses all things data. We cannot be an organization that is no longer, we've always been driven by data, but we have to be more focused and laser focused than ever to be able to implement the strategies we are about to embark on that are, and challenge our organization to do better, invest ourselves in the technology that we need to get our work done. Part of the work will be also be in, incorporating in the plan you'll see our 360 model, Philly Stat 360. Kristen Bray is here in the, in the room working out of the mayor's office. Yes. Uh, you know, so, so, so one of the things, one of the things we're excited about, you know, 360, Philly Stat 360, and the mayor was also excited about that, is when we all, at the end of the day, we gotta hold ourselves responsible. You know, the mayor says, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And you only find out what you do by looking at what you do. Right, and so what a part of what we're going to do is really be evaluating ourselves, looking at the news and crimes that we're going to be collaborating with our city agencies, our law enforcement partners, our community members, and other service providers to get the work done. But most importantly, driving our tactics and our community engagement in, 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 the, in, the, in the community that we serve. One of the biggest areas we're excited about is our community partnership. I think those are known, we've been known by community relations for a long time. But my, my job, my objective is community partnerships. I'm looking out in this room here and I'm looking at, hey, Dr. Cooper, how you doing? <laughs> Dr. Cooper, you know, is, is, is oversees the principals in the union and CASA, and she's a partner. She's not just a relationship, she's not somebody. She even calls me today. I think I still work in the school district the way she calls me. <laughs> and, but I see the, see the members of the board here. I see partners in this room. Hey, Dr. Nye. Right? I can pick through this room because I see partners. And so part of our community partnership is creating a new community partnership bureau. Uh, uh, Commissioner Maisha Massey is here. Um, stand up for a minute. You know, Captain Massey, I mean, Captain Massey, I'm demoted you and promoted you, right? <laughs> Commissioner Massey will be taking over the community partnership bill and really building out you know, working with our captains to do hand-to-hand, -hand, right, creating synergy, working with our, our community to build relations, problem solving, and working with our district to be doing better in our outreach with, them, with the individual. We'll be adding community members, non-sworn professional staff, working in the community alongside whatever. You can't have community policing without people in the community working with you. Yeah. And, and, and so, so for the first time, we'll be adding those elements to it. But one of the, also the things that will be unique is that under community partnerships, all of those nuisance incidences, those neighborhood services, our vice, our nuisance task force, will all come under one umbrella so we can properly service the community in the most effective way. One of the things we're also excited about, and that's why I keep looking back at, at Rob when he gives, you know, and the mayor, you know, <laughs> is modernization. The reality is that we're going to be moving forward as an organization. We need to modernize. And so part of that work will really, really, for the first time, we'll be able to introduce a, a, a system where we're going paperless, where we have electronic work that we can do our paperwork. Uh, so we'll be going paperless. We'll be in-car cameras. will be added to most of our fleet. So for the first time, we'll have cameras both in our cars. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the body-worn cameras, we will have camera, we will have sensor devices on our handguns. So when our officers pull their guns, their body cameras will automatically go off. I'm going to put sensors on you guys out there drinking some wine, too. They, I didn't, that's pretty good. Y'all get excited about that. Uh, uh, but part of that, again, that, that work is doing, and that also complements our tasers. When we pull our tasers, since they got to clap for that, uh, we, we, uh, we also, our cameras will go off in that space as well. I think the mayor, went, as part of her charge, came, when she came in, she said prevention, intervention, and enforcement, pie. 
And it's, it's, I think sometimes we, we miss that part. You know, my struggles in, in, in looking from the outside, I was away from the department for seven years, is part of that pie was prevention and invention and enforcement. And the ability to, for the first time, talk about how that triangle works together. Right? It is all those three components that make us successful and, and bring safety uh, to, down. So we will be emphasizing in our prevention space. And I talked about the creation of our community partnership. I've talked about our 360 model and implementing our proactive policing initiatives and training in our space. Where are we going to be doing our intervention, focusing on early intervention? And I think all of you know in this room, my work is all for the, before I came back was really working in juvenile justice and working to divert young people away from the system. That will be very much rooted in our work. As I see NOMO, we're my team from NOMO and, and Anton Moore and others who are here, that we will be meeting and sitting down to walk through how do we do, get upstream and work with our young people to be able to give them off ramps. So our work will not just be about enforcement and just making arrests. But we will be moving into enforcement, ladies and gentlemen. We will be setting goals for ourselves to reduce our homicides and our shootings and our stolen autos. We will be looking to push in our phase two of our work into really, really focusing on, on bringing all crime down to historic levels that we had in previous years. You know, I, I also will now start to move into, you know, our Kensington community revival and, and talking about the work we will do in Kensington. You know, I, I think most of you, my, my, my struggles and my challenges with all of the work that we see on the way is oftentimes coming into a school where Principal Green hears a day, and I've talked about it in my swearing in, where we used to have almost seven, 800 kids in this school. And seeing what the, the, the issues are on the Kensington Carter and the things that are happening around here and the trauma that impact that school, that we're, we're over 100 now in Principal Green, I'm not sure, 150, I'm not sure of the numbers, and I don't want to get them wrong. But this school should be full, ladies and gentlemen. And, and so as we embark on our work, we will have a multi-phase approach. We will establish a dedicated implementation team to work with us in partnership. We will be working with the partners, building strong community partnerships, securing and vitalizing the Kensington Corridor, providing essential resources to residents and people struggling with addiction, and ultimately creating a safe and, and thriving community. And part of that work will be a five-phase approach. We'll be presenting the team with warnings and, and engaging individuals to give them the opportunity. And then we will move into an enforcement posture. I want to name that. Right? I don't want to put that on the side. I want to name that. We will move into a very empathetic but effective enforcement strategy led by, you want to stand up, uh, Commissioner Rosario? As we move through this process, we'll secure the neighborhood uh, and we will hold. And then we will work to transition the community over, back over to the community. We'll never be transitioned. We're just going to be working in partners. As we start to create a sustainability strategy, we will be with, where does the community, I want to let the community know here. We hear you, as the mayor says. We are not going to leave you. Once we start, we will be with you for the long haul. All right. Once you see the report, you'll see it outlined in more detail. And then one of the other areas that we will be focusing on as the mayor part of our executive order was building a stronger police department. And we're grateful that the, Governor Shapiro's work to change our academy percentile for physical fitness from 30 to 15 percent. We're very honored and appreciative of the work that our men and women within the police department and our city OHR has been able to increase our academies coming in every six, six weeks to, and reduce the weight time for them to come in. We are proud of the men and women. We've been able to start to streamline our application process, shortening that process down to 30 days. We are able to introduce a, a cadet program that the mayor challenged to do. And one of the areas you're going to see in our report is around redistricting. Part of the work now, we have to start looking across the city to see if we're effectively deployed and those lines that are drawing up the districts are accurate. And so we'll be going through that process to see. And we have expanded our, our footbeats across our corridors and our footbeat strategy into the community. By the summer, we'll have 128 men and women on foot across the city executing the mayor's plan. Now, you, you, know, you all know how the mayor is. I'm still about 162 short because there's 300, but we're working on it, Mayor. We're going to get you there. 
You know, so we're going to increase, we're part of our work, we're going to be increasing our civilian staffing into our space, increasing the number of radio dispatchers, but that's pretty good. <laughs> you know you're in the school when that goes off. So, so I'll end with this. I, I, again, um, we, we understand the road ahead is, is not going to be easy, um, but we're going to work together to get this done. We are going to make this a safer and, and a cleaner and greener uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and I am absolutely, absolutely honored to be in this position to lead this strategy under this mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear uh, in this order. Uh, we just heard from Commissioner Bethel, uh, Managing Director Adam Teal, then Adam Gear, our uh, Chief Public Safety Director, then Clean and Green Carlton Williams, Economic Opportunity Alba Martinez, uh, and then we'll come back for education in that order. Thank you, Mayor Parker, and thank all of you for being here on this, this great day. I started my career as an emergency medical technician and then became a firefighter. Like some of the folks you saw outside and see in this room, I have devoted my life to taking care of people, to taking care of communities, to taking care of neighborhoods. Like so many of our dedicated healthcare workers that are around this room working in various capacities. And at the center of our strategy for taking care of people. You can't have healthy communities without having safe communities. And we know that in this neighborhood and so many others across the city, there are so many dedicated women and men in our city of Philadelphia government and not just in government. All of our partners doing truly life-saving work from librarians administering Narcan to police officers, firefighters, medics, our health and human services workers. We are going to continue to take care of people. We are going to continue to save lives. <laughs> Nothing is going to stop that work. And we are going to do the rest. The mayor has a bold vision for continuing that care beyond life-saving treatment to and through the next steps in a holistic, comprehensive, and compassionate way. Compassionate to the people we take care of, compassionate to our communities, to our neighbors, to our children, by building and addressing the need for long-term housing, care and treatment. We have been convening local, state, federal, and nonprofit partners from all around the city and all around the state to explore every option and every funding source for providing long-term housing, care, and treatment for all of our most vulnerable residents, including the unhoused, and those suffering from addiction and mental health challenges. We will. Our mayor convened an inaugural meeting of almost 100 different providers, health care partners, including service providers, insurers, funders, and individuals with lived experience. Now this seemingly, here in the city of Eds and Meds, is something that we might have thought had been done before. We knew that for Mayor Parker, this was her inaugural convening. Well, we came to find out, those folks, our health systems, our providers, our insurers, and people with lived experience had never been in the same room. Thanks to Mayor Parker as that catalyst and bringing those folks together, we are continuing to meet with them to put them at the center of the design of this system of care where we are going to take care of people for as long as they need with whatever they need. We are in the detailed planning stages 
for triage and wellness centers that are going to provide residential care for unhoused individuals and families and those with a wide range of behavioral health needs. So far, everybody we've talked to agrees on the need for this and they agree that it doesn't exist without the mayor's bold vision and what is in her proposed budget and hopefully with help from our city council to support this bold vision, we are going to create a system to provide comprehensive treatment and dignified housing for our most vulnerable, unhoused residents. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We are going to get this done. Good afternoon, everyone. This has been the most fulfilling and exciting 100 days of my career. You get to limbo by people like the police commissioner, by the president. I want to then once again thank sincerely the mayor uh, for nominating me in city council, president for confirming me for this position. I'm honored and humbled to be here serving under this mayor. I'm clear-eyed about the work that needs to be done to make this the safest major city in America. While violent crime is decreasing, we cannot be satisfied. I am not satisfied. Instead, I'm focused on victims and co-victims of homicides, some of them children, and what could have been done to prevent their tragic losses. Recognizing the urgency of this moment, I and my team have hit the ground running. In the Office of Public Safety, many of them are in here today, have kicked into action to meet the goals of Mayor Parker's administration. In just three months, we've hired key executive positions, expanded the capacity of old programs, streamlined processes, and launched new initiatives, all in the interest of addressing gun violence through a holistic prevention, intervention, and enforcement approach. For example, expanding upon what works, our very successful group violence intervention program, better known as GVI. We've received over $600,000 in federal funding thanks to the advocacy of Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon. Okay, with that $600,000, this new funding, we're going to expand to serve young people in partnership with the Office of Children and Families. We as an office are going to start leaning into the need to deal with our children's trauma in a meaningful, intentional way as it relates to public safety. Our children are hurting, um, and we will do everything we can as an office, as an intergovernmental force, to bring the full weight of our resources to address what our youth need. Launched in August of 2020, GVI is a rigorously proven strategy to reduce shootings among high-risk members and violent groups. It's a partnership between our office, partners like the Police Department, Philadelphia Gun Violence Task Force, the District Attorney's Office, Attorney General's Office, U.S. Attorney's Office, Probation and Parole, Credible Messengers, many of whom are in this room and I want to acknowledge them, and Moral Messengers, right, most of whom are mothers who have lost their child to gun violence. And I was out this past weekend with our GVI team with the Miss Phyllis, and I'm not sure if she's here, many of you know Miss Phyllis, but we interacted with a, a mom, right? We were looking for her son. He was not there on location when our team went out Saturday morning. Mom was there. Miss Phyllis found out she was there. She jumped out of her, the van that we're all in, ran down to the door and engaged her in a conversation, right? Turns out this individual was in need of mental health treatment. Right there on the spot, our GVI coordinator, Deontay Sumter, who's doing a great job, set up within two days uh, a callback to try and get that mental health services to that person free of charge. Um, so that's the kind of work that our GVI team is doing. And we're going to expand that, as I said, to work with juveniles. And those caseworkers, those juvenile caseworkers for the youth, will focus on their families and the existing social service unit and assign those staff geographically with a focus on areas most impacted by gun violence in alignment with Commissioner Bethel's evidence and data-driven 100-day plan. The Office of the Victim Advocate, they are doing some incredible work. I wish I could get into all of it today, but they got an assist from the mayor. When I sat down with the mayor, the mayor said, why are we as administration not reaching out to each and every single 
um, co-victim the families of homicide victims personally? Why are we not doing that? I said, that's a, that's a great idea. Why are we not providing a list of resources immediately? Don't matter where you come from. Don't matter the circumstances of the homicide. If you died in the city of Philadelphia now, our Office of the Victim Advocate, Adair Combs, is sending out a letter highlighting all of the resources, state, federal, and likewise, for these co-victims so that we make sure we're connecting them to these services. Thank you, Mayor. That's the type of compassion and vision our mayor leads with every single day, and it's an honor to work with her and be in the same room and, and get these ideas and implement them. Another initiative I'm thrilled to share is our neighborhood resource centers, right, known as NRCs. They align perfectly with what the mayor came in wanting to do. We are pushing them. This is to support our returning citizens coming back from State Road and beyond. Right, the NRCs will be launched as a network across Philadelphia, replicating a very successful national model. They'll operate as a one-stop shop for our returning citizens to access holistic range of services, employment training, opportunities, mental health counseling, drug treatment options, assistance in getting critical documents like birth certificates and social security cards, right? All in one place. We're going to be removing these barriers, and we're going to be placing them across the city. The mayor's vision. And if you think about it, that kind of program, right, that kind of thought, that goes to prevention in my mind, that of the pie prevention. We're providing, we're removing barriers and providing meaningful opportunities right at the source, right? That ORP, Office of Branch Partnerships, that starts up on State Road. They start their work there in preparation for when our returning citizens, our brothers, sisters, and folks are coming back. We're going to set them up for success. This is the tip of the iceberg of what the Office of Public Safety is working on every day to implement the various vision to address prevention, intervention, and enforcement. It's our mission to stop gun violence in Philadelphia once and for all. We will achieve that. I will not rest until the job is done. I want to thank the mayor again and our incredible, talented partners up here and our community out there. We could not do this work. We could not be successful as a city without your buy-in. As the mayor says, one Philly, that is absolutely true. I look forward to working with every single one of you to make this the safest city in the country. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chief Public Safety Director Gear. In our action plan, the mayor shared our long-term vision of working to make sure Philadelphia is clean, green, and resilient while encouraging residents to partner in improving their communities. And boy, oh boy, did we see that in action last Saturday at our annual Philly Spring Cleanup. We mobilized and engaged thousands of volunteers across 1,134 cleaning and greening projects across the city of Philadelphia. This was by far the largest number of projects in the spring cleanup's 17-year history. Yes, that is the kind of energy, can-do spirit, and people power that proves that we truly are one Philly, a united city. Our job at the Office of Clean and Green Initiatives is to take that enthusiasm and engagement and provide the supports and structures to, for it to be year-round, not just a twice-a-year blitz. Madam Mayor, we're on the case. This month, we're launching the One Philly United City Anti-Litter Campaign a call for residents to join the fight against litter and illegal dumping and other quality of life issues and partner with us in addressing these issues throughout the year. We'll use a mix of multimedia approaches and events to increase awareness and participation. We'll spread the word with eye catch and branding on city assets, including recycling bins, big belly trash cans, and trash compactors, and we'll direct folks to the tools and resources they can use to keep their environment clean. We've laid the foundation for this campaign through our three-year, 100-day, 100, 100 three initiatives, announcing a new approach to addressing persistent quality of life issues, convening a clean and green cabinet, and continuing to expand the PHL Taking Care of Business TCB program, which I'll share brief updates in a minute. Starting with the new approach, 
On a cold Friday in February, we piloted our new holistic intergovernmental coordinated service model on the 29th Street corridor in North Philadelphia. And if, when I call your agency's name, would you please stand because I truly want everyone to see this coordinated effort that we're introducing to the public. A cross-agency team including sanitation, Crystal Jacob Shipman, <laughs> license and inspection, Bridget Greenwald Collins, commerce, Alba Martinez is with me, but Dennis Murphy is in the back. I see you back there. The police department, Deputy Commissioner Massey, Parks and Recreation Commissioner Susan Slauson, the Parking Authority, Rich Laser and his team, the School District, Oz Hill, SEPTA, OIT, and so many others. In other words, as the mayor has made sure that she says, no more silos. We're addressing these problems holistically straight on. The response from our residents and local stakeholders were powerful. They hadn't seen anything like it before, and we had all gotten far too used of the unsatisfactory status quo. As the mayor said in her budget address, we hadn't been getting the basics right, and there won't be any more excuses for failing to do so. We know we need to break down silos, deliver services more effectively and efficiently, and use data to direct our attention first and foremost to our hardest hit neighborhoods. And we're doing just that. We're scheduling nine more demonstrations of our new model along with some of our most blight challenges corridors across the city. We've designed and implemented a new clean and green ticker that identifies and tracks quality of life service requests, including the number of requests, map locations, and open and closed requests. We've developed a beta version of our community appearance index, highlighting neighborhoods with numerous quality of life issues. And we'll use that CAI to set a geographic baseline of quality life conditions throughout the city with the aim of identifying areas with the most need and implementing strategic action to definitively address them. We expect to in and intend that the data-driven approach will result in more attention towards historically underserved neighborhoods where older, smaller, and more limited housing and geographic street layouts can exasperate litter and blight conditions. Let me take a moment here to plug our plan to plant 15,000 trees over the next five years. <laughs> Supporting our tree canopy goals through the Philly Tree Plan, addressing urban heat islands and contributing to a cleaner, greener, more serene spaces that everyone should have access to. Turning our, to our second 100-day initiatives, we're launching our Clean and Green Cabinet this month. We'll have over 30 cabinet members representing a variety of backgrounds, including community members and organizations, businesses and industry, waste reduction and environmental groups, and intergovernmental partners. The cabinet's charge is to organize government agencies, businesses, community partners, and other stakeholders around a comprehensive, data-driven plan to reduce the generation of waste, increase rates of recycling, tackle litter and illegal dumping, and improve the environment and quality of life in our neighborhoods. Our third 100-day initiative, a point of pride for our mayor, is the continued expansion of the PHLTCB program with our good friends with our good friends in commerce will be partnered to take TCB to new heights expanded to additional commercial corridors across the city and to corridor adjacent residential streets TCB's expansion will be paired with enhanced cleaning by the sanitation department and our partners in area near corridors a force multiplier in our cleaning and greening efforts I see some of our outstanding TCB members in the auditorium today. Please rise so that we can give you a big round of applause. We are honored 
to be contributed to the mayor's bold and ambitious vision of Philadelphia being the cleanest and greenest big city in America, and we look forward to continue to partner with you all in all that work. I am now happy to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Commerce Director Alba Martinez. Buenos dias, buenas tardes. Thank you, Carlton, so much. And I want to thank our mayor for not only leading an administration, but I think she's leading a movement to give Philadelphia our rightful place on the world's stage our rightful place in the world stage as the best city in America. Thank you, Mayor, because we are gonna do that. I have the privilege of talking about our Parker administration's work to create economic opportunity for all. The economic opportunity section in our 100-day plan has more initiatives than any other section. And that is not an accident. Because to address the significant and growing economic disparities facing our city, to turn them around, to end them once and for all, we need to move on multiple fronts, and we need to do it fast. We have to make it easier to start and grow businesses here in Philadelphia. We need to support diverse entrepreneurs and increase their access to capital at all stages of their journey. We need to expand access to good paying jobs, paying family sustaining wages. And we need to support our neighbors who face unique barriers to opportunity. The Mayor's Action Plan laid down markers in each of these areas, and I'm excited to share a brief update with you on the work that is underway, much of it driven by um, my amazing colleagues on stage this afternoon and in the audience. As the Mayor often says, regulatory burdens impose a time tax on our local businesses, diverting resources and attention away from hiring that next employee or opening that new location. Based on feedback from our local business community, we know everything to, we need to do to reduce the cost and complex, uh, complexity businesses face. Because when they navigate local government and it's easy, we can help spur additional economic growth. And this is why I'm thrilled the mayor included a PHL Open for Business initiative in her action plan. Through this initiative, we will create a best-in-class client service experience to help businesses start, grow, relocate to, and remain in Philadelphia. We're pursuing multiple strategies, including removing unnecessary regulatory steps, streamlining processes, accelerating approval timelines, and offering trusted guidance, advocacy, resources, and targeted investments that help businesses thrive. The mayor and I will have much more to say about this at Monday morning's PHL Open for Business Executive Order signing. I assure you that our work will be grounded in the experience of our clients, local entrepreneurs and businesses, big and small, and informed by the insights of our frontline colleagues. We know the best solutions to problems come from the people who are most proximate to them. A case on point is the Department of Licenses and Inspections. The recent Joint Task Force on Regulatory Reform for LNI offered a series of recommendations for short, medium, and long-term action. True to form, one of the first recommendations Mayor Parker took up was a complex one that was made years ago for the first time. And that was restructuring LNI into two divisions, each responsible for a core set of services. The Quality of Life Division is now led by Commissioner Bridget Collins Greenwald. And the Inspection, Safety and Compliance Division is now headed by Commissioner Basil Miranda.
When Mayor Parker announced this change, Peter Vaira, who led the special commission on LNI a decade ago, said, this is a big surprise. I thought that change was dead as a doornail. But anyone who knows our mayor wasn't surprised. Her bold action and LNI reflects her intense focus on new approaches to long-standing challenges, better aligning people and data and resources to deliver results that matter for our residents. Now, this next part is especially near and dear to my heart. One of the mayor's priorities coming into office was, a, was to establish an Office of Minority Business Success, or MBS, which would bolster minority businesses in Philadelphia, creating a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem and connecting diverse businesses to opportunity. The mayor found a tremendous leader for this work in Rachel Branson, who is establishing MBS as a trusted resources to help answer questions, field concerns, and make connections both within and outside city government. Rachel and her team are breaking down silos and working across sectors to remove barriers and expand opportunity. And next on her agenda is aligning with PIDC to create a fund with flexible underwriting standards for early stage and small minority businesses. And in the meantime, MBS and Commerce will partner to monitor $2 million in upcoming city investments in two local funds, the Innovate Capital Fund and the Philadelphia Accelerator Fund. And these support local minority businesses to get to scale. And speaking of capital investments, our Business Roundtable Director, Donovan West, is taking the lead in convening an equitable capital table. Thank you, Donovan. This equitable capital table will be chaired by a local banking executive, and it will bring together local and national investors who commit to making capital investments in our local diverse businesses. And we'll be leveraging and extending the reach of our city investment with these new private dollars. Thank you, Rachel and Donovan, for your leadership and partnership. The mayor has been crystal clear about the importance of workforce development and of connecting people to quality jobs, those with family-sustaining wages, benefits, and a path to economic opportunity. That's why one of her first official acts was to sign an executive order to remove barriers to city employment. She charged her team with identifying city jobs requiring a college degree where experience or other credentials could be used instead to show needed competencies or skills. Our colleagues, one working under the leadership of Chief Administrative Officer Camille Ducas here. Ducasse, thank you for being here and your support. They, under Camille's leadership, have risen to the occasion, and they've identified 70 additional civil service roles for which degree alternatives are appropriate, and will be proposing those changes to the Civil Service Commission. And they're not done yet. Next up is analyzing all remaining degree requiring civil service jobs and doing a first ever analysis of exempt positions for degree alternatives. We are widening the doors to opportunity by the month. And this work, and this work wonderfully complements our many ongoing and upcoming efforts to support workforce development, including the expansion of the PHLTCB program and opportunities for our cleaning ambassadors to access the Future Track program, a pipeline to guaranteed employment in full-time union jobs with our city. Also, the development of the first in the nation, I want to say this again, a first in the nation, City College for Municipal Employment. <laughs> which will enable us to grow, upskill, and support our city workforce, training the next generation of our public servants. And a $10 million investment in the mayor's proposed budget is there to expand employer partnerships, include, including apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships, 
that include commitments to employment and not just a conveyor belt of training programs. The mayor knows some of our neighbors face additional barriers to economic opportunity. Chief Public Safety Director Adam Gere spoke earlier about exciting work underway to open neighborhood resource centers, one-stop shops for connecting our returning citizens with services and supports. Our foreign-born neighbors also often face significant barriers. The mayor recognizes our city's diversity as a tremendous strength, which is why she's committed to seeking renewal of the city's certification as a welcoming city for immigrants. Our Office of Immigrant Affairs is hard at work analyzing the recertification standards, convening a task force to plan next steps, and building out a welcoming plan for our city. We know Philadelphia will truly thrive when we build an equitable and inclusive economy that fully leverages the talent and potential in every neighborhood across our great city. Let's build on our strengths and spread the good word about One Philadelphia, a united city. And with that, over to my colleague, Chief Education Officer Deborah Carrera for an update on education. Thank you. Again, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Deborah Carrera, the Chief Education Officer, and I am so glad to be here. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity. This is a surreal moment. Can, can everybody feel what's happening in the room? Look at your neighbor and say, do you feel this? And then tell your neighbor, this is what change feels like. Come on, can we give another round of applause for our mayor on this 100th day celebration? I'm very excited to be here because I am also a graduate of Conwell Middle Magnet School. So I am a diamond in the rough. And so this is surreal and it's emotional for me because many, many know and some of you don't know and I'm gonna get to my notes, but my mother was a single mother who raised six children and of her six children, five of us came to Conwell Middle Magnet School. And Madam Mayor, that changed the trajectory of our lives because we were born and raised in Kensington. My mother did not finish school. She has a sixth grade education. But it was teachers that told my mother, hey, there's a school not far from you called Combo Middle Magnet School, and your kids should go. We will make sure that they are prepared to take the test at that time to come here. So this is a very powerful moment for me, and I'm so honored because our mayor has picked the best and the brightest. And we are committed to your children. We are committed to young people. And we promise that we will do better. I'm laughing because when we were here, we did, we did the play Hamlet. And I'm Puerto Rican, so I was Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. And my brother was Hamlet. And I remember my line, the queen doth speaketh. Yes, I did. That's all I remember. But it's a thrill to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Green, this for the uh, administration 100th day and sharing an update on our educational efforts. Our North Star set by our mayor. It is to provide a world-class education system for all. Everybody say all. all. All of our Philadelphia students, all ages, all social and economic backgrounds, ELL, special ed, migrant, all of our children, black, brown, Asian, all. And with the strong partnerships we formed and innovative approaches we are pursuing, I'm so confident that we're gonna do this. Along with our terrific superintendent, Dr. Watlington, and my incredible colleague, Chief Deputy Managing Director, Vanessa Garrett Harley, right here. We're gonna share a brief update on the progress. And I wanna first, before I get ahead of myself, I wanna thank, um, after a diligent process that was led by Otis Bullock. Otis, can you stand up? And the education nominating panel, and if there's anyone that was on the education nom nominating panel, they can stand. This was a panel appointed by our mayor 
to find the best and the brightest, thank you, to serve as our, uh, our nominees are here today and they were introduced by the mayor earlier. And we're very excited about this group of nominees. This group brings years of experience and diversity of skills and perspectives that will help the district and Dr. Watlington to continue to achieve the ambitious goals that they have set for the school district of Philadelphia. Second, I want to give you a quick reminder. This is really important because how many know that we need money to get things done, right? Yes. And so this is a quick reminder about the mayor's proposed budget, which is in city council for consideration. <laughs> as I look at council president. The mayor, is, ready, listen, listen to this. The mayor is proposing an additional $129 million of local investments in the school district over the coming five years to accelerate progress. That's a round of applause. Because you can't have a world-class education if our kids don't have access. You can't have a world-class education if our kids don't see the careers and the, and the education that they can have in the future. So you have to build that, and we're gonna do that. Our word choice there is intentional, echoing Dr. Wallington's Accelerate Philly strategic plan for the school district. Dr. Wallington, would you please come forward and share a few remarks about your plan and the progress thus far? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Mayor, I appreciate the opportunity, opportunity to share. And I'm so excited that you chose to spend your 100th day in a Philadelphia school. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Carrera. And um, here to share good news, uh, Mayor, uh, you've set some high standards for a world-class education here in the school district. And I want you to give you an update really quickly on Accelerate Philly, our five-year strategic plan. Uh, we've often talk about, talked about if we stand together and practice the kind of real partnership, non-siloed partnership that Mayor Parker often uh, reminds us about, then we certainly can become the fastest improving large urban school district in the country. As we prepare all of our children for any future they can realize or imagine. Well, as part of the mayor's One Philadelphia, a United City mantra, we're doing just that under your leadership, Mayor. Uh, recently, within the past month or so, researchers from Harvard and St Stanford universities issued a national report, the first of its kind since schools were shut down during the pandemic in March of 2020. And they wanted to answer one question. If we look across the United States, how are our children doing? How are children doing in the states relative to reading and math performance? And what the researchers from Harvard and Stanford found after they studied, 60% of the entire U US student population was in this study, and it covered 30 states, and they found that the school district of Philadelphia is outpacing the large urban districts in the US in reading and math. Let's give our students a hand. And I'm inspired by the mayor's commitment and vision to partnership. Uh, Commissioner Bethel th talked about that as well. So when we think about the hard work of our parents, our staff, and our students, and our union presidents like Dr. Robin, Coos Robin Cooper with CASA, uh, and Mr. Jerry Jordan with the PFT, and all of our other unions, let's give them one more round of applause. So, Mayor, under your Board of Education's goals and guardrails, uh, our district is absolutely accelerating. If you look over time, I'll give you just three quick examples. Number one, uh, we know that children graduating means something, and children dropping out means something very different, because dropping out of school is a life or death issue in these United States. Uh, certainly, when we look at academic achievement over the past 10 years, our black and brown boys uh, have suffered the most in terms of academic outcomes. Under the ninth grade on track work in partnership with the great work and support of the New Barra Family Foundation, uh, black boys have increased their on track performance by 10 percentage points and Latino boys by nine percentage points. S 
Secondly, uh, teacher attendance is up, student attendance is up, our test scores are up in 13 out of 17 areas, and the dropout rate is down. We are excited about that. Even though the number of kids who drop out in our city has been reduced by more than 1,100 students, we know we have a lot of work to do. So I am so grateful to you, Mayor Parker, for your exceptional work as an ally to uh, the schools, all of the children, as you say, in the, all 197 plus thousand children in this school district. And I want to just commend you, Madam Mayor, for appointing such a distinguished Board of Education or nominating such a distinguished <laughs> Board of Education. Uh, I began my career as a history teacher some 30 years ago this year, Mayor Parker. I got started real early. I know you were an English teacher. You know what they say, English teachers, history teachers. Um, but uh, I, I can say without fear of contradiction, I've never had the opportunity to work with a board with such an impressive set of credentials and the ability to do the good work on behalf of our children. So thank you for nominating these outstanding people. What is our goal in the district? We want to prepare all of our children uh, to graduate prepared to participate in the nation, the world's largest economy. And, uh, Madam Mayor, we want to be able to ask that question, like the Maasai peoples, how are the children? And we won't rest under your leadership, Madam Mayor, until we can answer that question resoundingly for all 197,000 children, that the ch all the children are well. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you again, and it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Chief Deputy Managing Director, Vanessa Garrett Hartley, who leads our Office of Children and Families. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna be real quick. I know it's warm. I'm gonna use those two minute rules like we do in church. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Watlington. I just want to touch briefly on three really exciting collaborations that we're doing with the school district that will help advance the mayor's vision for education in our city. First, in early childhood education, we have a successful PHL pre-K program where we give free pre-K to three and four-year-olds. You only have to be a resident of Philadelphia, but we go into the next level with that. Um, Aligning with the mayor's vision in early childhood education, we're going to partner to launch a one-stop enrollment option for families to apply for any free pre-K seat in the city. So it won't matter whether it's PHL pre-K, Head Start, or pre-K counts. You'd only have to fill out that one application and be able to get your young person into an opportunity. So we want to remove all the barriers that we can that would stand in the way of a parent connecting their youngest learners with those formative early childhood years. We know that education is the key to a whole lot of things in the city. We know that the young people are our future. The mayor understands that and cares about young people extremely. Um, and so we're working together to do that and the best time to start is when they are the youngest and like a sponge, they will, su they will suck up everything you teach them at those young ages and that's the fundament to get them ready for the school district when they get ready to go into their kindergarten and first grade classes. Secondly, we're fundamentally revamping our approach to summer youth employment and workforce exploration for our older learners. In conjunction with our partners at Philadelphia Works and the Philadelphia School District, we are launching something that we're calling Career Connected Learning, or C2L PHL. That means we're gonna be able to provide 8,000 summer employment opportunities for our young people. And they will range for young people from the ages of 12 to 24, C2L will provide work-based learning experiences, career awareness through internships, they'll do job shadowing. It will give our young people an opportunity to get exposure to many careers and other things as they think about what path they want to move forward. And it will also put some much needed funds in the pockets of many of our young people. Yeah. And last, but definitely far from being least, we are partnering with the school district 
to launch what we call the Summer Achievers Program, which is a full day, six week summer program that works with academic instruction in the morning school district, school district teachers will be providing academic instruction in math, English, language arts in the morning. And in the afternoon, it will partner with our out of school time. That's my time, right? Two more minutes. <laughs> Uh, in the afternoon, we'll partner with our out-of-school time programs to provide a more camp-like fun experience, but it will occupy these young people all day. And we know as we do a lot of work with um, Commissioner Bethel and our Deputy Commissioner Massey and others, the key to keeping young people and to helping to settle down some of the uh, problems we're experiencing with our juveniles and juvenile justice is keeping them busy with positive, connected opportunities. And this program will serve over 4,000 students this summer and it'll be made available at no cost to families. Again, there's no cost to enroll your young people. I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Carrera. Just want to 